heart of where innovation, money, and power collide in Silicon Valley and beyond. This is Bloomberg Technology with Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow. Live from Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York, I'm Caroline Hyde. And I'm Ed Ludlow here in New York City. This is Bloomberg Technology. And coming up, we have full coverage of the Instacart IPO as the grocery delivery and software company. It gets ready to trade this hour much more ahead. Plus, Apple seeing bright spots in China as iPhones sell out within minutes of being released. I will speak with Eric Whitman, the incoming CEO of photo and video app Visco, get his outlook for the social media company. But, of course, we want to really be digging in in the hot news of the day. This is largely around an IPO story. Instacart, of course, finally a VC-backed company coming to the markets. We're anticipating that first trade. Katie Roof is here also anticipating all your sources waiting with bated breath. Remind us as to whether or not they're making money on this because we do know that the valuation is significantly lower than in the heyday of COVID for them. Sure. I think, you know, it depends on when they invested. I mean, if, you know, anyone who just invested in the round in 2021 where they were valued at $39 billion, they're not making money yet, if ever. But uh, the, the, the investors that invested very early, you know, when it was just a tiny startup, then certainly, you know, it's turned into a multi-billion dollar company. Um, and, you know, early indications show that this company is probably going to pop a, a significant pop, mm. maybe like 30% or more. And so that would put it at or above the $13 billion valuation that the company lowered itself to last year, its internal valuation. So the company is a, was aware of market conditions yeah. and market realities. They knew that, you know, $13 billion was, um, you know, a more reasonable target. More than a decade old, this company, since its founding, it has changed the way in which it sort of strategizes, moves forward, particularly under Fiji Simo, the new CEO. I spoke with her and discussed sort of the era of competition. And it really does feel as though Fiji sees everyone as a competitor in many ways. They fundamentally, though, say they are uncontested market leader in grocery deliver, delivery, but they're continuing to really gain share. They're looking at strengthening, in particular, the competitive advantages of ultimately advertising, of software. Katie, how has this company pivoted under Fiji? Sure, yeah. So many people think of them just from the consumer-facing side where they receive groceries. But obviously, uh, if you look at their, their revenue, they have a lot of different revenue streams. Uh, they have software they, uh, you know, to help with fulfillment. They've really strengthened their advertising business, which is, uh, you know, they have so much data about consumers and what they like to buy, which is really valuable for people trying to advertise groceries. So uh, they, they've done a lot of different things. And also they, also they have subscriptions, so people pay more to be regular customers of Instacart. And something that's been a little controversial, sometimes they charge more per the price of the item uh, than what you would pay in store. So they're collecting revenue from customers in a lot of different ways, and particularly from business partners. Now, I don't know if my household's different, but actually it's my husband who generally does the grocery order our Instacart from time to time. But I spoke with Fiji about what this means as a moment. Look, there are very few women bringing companies to IPO. It's also notable that she feels that a lot of her customers are women. 70% of the shoppers are women. So it's really important, she says, to build the right product, have the right voices at the table. She's really been trying to lean into the amount of executives, a diverse leadership team that she has, Katie. But talk us through that team and what this means for, well, not the founder, but certainly a female CEO to bring a company to list when we see, what, less than 1% of all IPOs being led by women? Yeah, certainly it's a very low number of newly public companies that are helmed by a woman. But, yeah, she makes a good point. I mean, a large percentage of household budgets are controlled by women. So you look at who a lot of the people are that are buying groceries, it's women. And so uh, certainly, you know, it helps to bring that perspective. But, yeah, I mean, you know, she's you know, the current CEO. She's someone who's very seasoned in the business world. She worked her way up at Facebook being, you know, one of one of the top executives there. So. She's not some, you know, junior person who didn't know what she was doing. She, she's, you know, already well respected in the tech world. And boy, she brought her advertising prowess to this particular business. Katie Roof bringing us all the inside track on what is a VC 
Unicorn finally listing after a couple of years hiatus. Let's get a little bit more on the world of IPOs and just talk to Nick Einhorn, his director of research over at Renaissance Capital. And we're on the trajectory. We've had ARM, that popped. Yes, it seems to be rolling over somewhat now, but it wasn't VC backed. Now we get the likes of Instacart. Then we look to a Clavio. How important are these listings, Nick? Yeah, they're definitely very important. Um, it's really been Two years with almost no tech IPOs. Um, you know, one or two mobile I was a successful one last year, but these three deals in the last week um, are definitely a good barometer for the health of the tech IPO market. And like you said, Arm has been public before. It's a very mature company, so it's really Instacart and Clavio that I think are the better indicator for where tech appetite is among amongst investors right now. What do you make of the way in which this company has been listed? It was notable that they sort of priced on a Monday. That's not usual. But they really were trying to ride on the coattails, it felt like, of Arm. The fact that they've got a CFO who was at Goldman leading these sorts of issuances. We know that they're well navigating these sorts of markets. But the fact that we could get quite a big pop, it seems like, at the, original, at the initial trade. Are they leaving too much money on the table to have a successful IPO? I don't think so. I mean, we know we're in an environment where IPO market... Um, the IP market has not been particularly strong lately. Um, certainly, there's a lot of caution out there on the part of investors. And so I think they needed to convince investors that it was a good valuation, that the stock was being positioned to trade well. They got the cornerstone investors involved, as well as the private placement from PepsiCo. So kind of a lot of things um, to sort of help make sure the deal is a success for investors. I and I think part of why... Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, just a little bit about the competitive moat or lack thereof, Nick, there's been some hand-wringing about really how much they can fight off not only some sort of frenemies, their customers who might be building out their own e-commerce plays, the fact that they are also seeing competitive elements from Amazon as well. Who is the key competitor for you? Yeah, I think uh, there's definitely a, a bunch of them. Amazon is one. DoorDash, I think, is an interesting one. Um, obviously, they're more focused on restaurant delivery, but they've been building a grocery business um, over the last few years, and they've taken a lot of share and kind of smaller transactions, so more impulse buys versus the weekly shop. Uh, Instacart thinks they still have a good advantage over the kind of the weekly purchasing, but um, in, uh, DoorDash is definitely a key competitor. And then the grocery retailers themselves, especially Walmart, uh, some of the other big ones, are definitely competitors, but Instacart also works with them, a lot of them on the back end technology. So Instacart, I think, is trying to kind of shore itself up there. Nick, what have you learned about the risk tolerance that technology investors have now the IPO window broadly is open back it up? Yeah, I think there's definitely still um, some caution out there. We're not in the 2020, 2021 mindset. But one indicator we look at is the uh, Renaissance IPO index, which is the underlying index for our, our ETF that tracks the IPO market. And that's up about 33% year to date versus about 17% for the S&P 500. So I've definitely seen some of that risk appetite come back into uh, the space over the last year. It's still not where it was, but I think we're, you know, we're in the right direction for IPO activity to increase. There's a lot of excitement, right? You know, there is some sort of IPO window back. And in the background, you have the Fed. We started talking about China. We started talking about the macro and the economy globally. How short lived do you think this IPO window is going to be? You know, I, I like to be optimistic. Um, Good. <laughs> one, one indicator we look at a lot is the VIX, the volatility index. And that tends to um, signal whether IP activity is increasing or decreasing. And that's been coming down this year generally. It's in the teens now, I believe. So that's usually a good level for IPO activity, but obviously a lot can change quickly. So, you know, fingers crossed we can maintain good activity going forward. Why getting Renaissance Capital on is so important for our viewers is because you are doing that hard work of pre-IPO companies, bringing that research, that transparency. Who then are you waiting for who's waiting in the wings when we think we get through this week of Instacart, of Clavio? Is it on to Churo? Who are the other key names that you're going to be keeping and updating your research on? Yeah, Churo updated their prospectus recently, so we think they're likely to come soon. Birkenstock filed a few weeks ago, obviously on a tech name, but a well-known consumer name following on from some successful consumer IPOs in the summer. And then beyond that, there's a lot of companies that are waiting in the wings, probably looking to see how Instacart and Clavio do this week. Um, you know, companies like everybody from Reddit, um, you know, down the line, lots of tech companies, lots of companies in other industries. So we think there's definitely a big backlog. It's just a question of when they think conditions will be right.
All right, Nick Ihorn of Renaissance Capital, thank you for your time. I want to get a quick check on the markets because there's other news stories out there driving individual names. One we're looking at is Block. Uh, Lisa Henry is leaving the company nine years at Block. She ran the Square business. Jack Dorsey, who is already at the head of Block and chairman of the board, is going to come in and run Square. And analysts saying they see that as a positive, even though it's a longtime leader leaving that company, a stock that's not done well year to date. Disney down almost 4%. They're doubling their CapEx commitment for the parks, entertainment and products division to 60 billion over a 10-year period. They're going to be investing in the theme parks and cruise lines business. We're getting more insight into what Bob Iger is doing. Now that he's back at Disney, what's the strategy? That moving the stock lower. And Amazon down 2.8%. They just announced they're hiring 250,000 seasonal workers for the holiday period, particularly in logistics. This is a company that ended the June quarter, had 1.46 million employees, having actually cut back, Cara, as you know, throughout the early parts of the year. That kind of weighing on the stock, it had been down anyway amid everything that's going on this week. And by the way, just a quick update on Arm. We're in its third trading session, fourth trading session now, and it's trading at $54.80. We're below the price where it opened on Thursday. Interesting how short-lived that was in terms of the pop that we got and then the downward trajectory thereafter, Cara. Maybe a little profit taking, maybe a little, still above that $51 where at price, but notable as we check on these other IPOs. But Ed, I mean, we've got a wild story coming up for everyone because Microsoft has uploaded confidential documents to a federal court by mistake. It's all on that website. We'll have more on what they reveal. That's next in this is Bloomberg Technology. Okay, time for some talking tech. And today we talk all things Microsoft, starting with its AI research team accidentally exposing a large cache of private data on the software development platform GitHub. That's according to a new research from a cybersecurity firm called Wiz. The exposed data included Microsoft employees' personal computer backups, secret keys, and more than 30,000 internal Microsoft Teams messages. Plus, Amazon's hiring Microsoft's product chief, Panos Pane, to run the division responsible for Alexa and Echo smart speakers. That, according to Bloomberg sources. Pane is almost 20-year veteran who led Microsoft's Windows team and was central to the company's hardware push with its Surface computers. And Microsoft plans to refresh the Xbox consoles in the holiday season of 2024. That's according to a product roadmap mistakenly posted online as part of its case against the FTC. The changes are improvements to power consumption, better wireless technologies and built-in storage and a physical redesign. This is one hell of a leak. Let's get more on it with Bloomberg's Cecilia De Anastasio, who's with us in New York. Let's start with how on earth that information came to light. Thank you so much for having me. Um, we are hearing that uh, Microsoft accidentally leaked confidential documents about plans around new Xbox consoles, refreshed Xbox consoles as soon as 2024, upcoming games that have never been announced before, mm. and a variety of things. Can we get to the bottom of how or who? Because there must be a lot of hand-wringing internally today. There's a lot of hand-wringing internally today, especially because of the other leak that you referenced yes, earlier. bad week. Yes. Um, our understanding at Bloomberg, a source told us that um, it was not the FTC behind the leak, it was Microsoft. Okay, so Microsoft potentially some trying to trail back as to who and how, but does this happen often? Do we see these sorts of leaks and, and this sort of integral data that actually is very hard to find in terms of price points, in terms of ultimately IP that they're going to be revealing? Gaming companies are famously very, very secretive about upcoming plans around these things, and this is the biggest leak in Xbox history, hmm. it's fair to say. Okay, I get it. There's a leak. Leaks happen. The big news is we're getting a mid-cycle Xbox console <laughs> refresh, which just doesn't happen. Like, and full disclosure, as our audience knows, I'm a PS5 guy right now. What do we know about this new Xbox? I have to say, personally, I'm shocked because in June, um, Xbox head Phil Spencer told me that um, he didn't see an imperative to have a mid-cycle refresh. And so we're kind of trying to reconcile this competing information now. <laughs> Um, but it is typical for after four years a console to come out with a refresh that has increased storage like you were saying and things along those lines. So, so I, I guess bigger picture is we did get some insight into Microsoft's 
video game strategy. What, what did we learn? We learned that Xbox is planning a mid-cycle refresh as soon as 2024 and a new console as soon as 2028. Um, of course, these plans are subject to change as everything in the gaming industry um, can be very volatile all the time. We learned about updates to beloved games, including from Bethesda, which is part of Zenimax, which Microsoft acquired as well. We learned about um, uh, discussions around acquiring a Nintendo, which we knew that those discussions had happened. We didn't know that the board was interested as well mm. until the recent leaks this morning. And I mean, in this macro context where we're thinking of a Federal Reserve tomorrow eyeing inflationary pressures, I was interested that price points aren't going to be going up, even by 2024. It is surprising because the price points on video games have gone up from $60 to $70. Um, but consoles are, you know, something that are, they are a luxury item. They're mm -hmm. very expensive. And especially when um, gaming PCs are becoming increasingly popular and eating up more and more of kind of um, what people would spend on consoles, you know, it, it makes sense. Makes sense. Makes sense. Bloomberg, Cecilia D. Anastasio on set here in New York. Thank you. Now, coming up on Bloomberg Technology, Apple's iPhone 15 is all the rage in China, even after Beijing expanded a ban on Apple products in many public workplaces. All those details next. This is Bloomberg Technology. Apple's iPhone 15 is off to a strong start in China. The new iPhone sold out on China's Tmall within a minute of becoming available, according to the site's operator. For more, I'm going to bring in Bloomberg Intelligence senior tech analyst Anurag Rana. Anurag, you and I and Caroline have been talking about China for a week now when it comes to Apple. What is your first impressions of how the next-gen handset's doing? No, it's a good news. And uh, as, as we have talked before, China is the biggest wild card for Apple over the next 12 months. So any news like this is good news for Apple. There's iPhone sales, which, you know, all of us know will dictate Apple's overall financial performance uh, in the near term. So in the June quarter, Apple went from a 3% year on year decline to an 8% top line growth. And what Tim Cook said was it was switches. And my understanding of switches, it's somebody buying an iPhone for the first time or transferring from a domestic brand. How do you see the technology upgrades on this next gen iPhone 15 being a part of that switching story? Yeah, I mean, our analysts in Asia already told me a while ago that the camera upgrade is such a big deal that it's going to drive a lot of enthusiasts to go out and get the Pro Max model, which is what excited us most during the event that actually the pricing for that went up. So overall, I think this is a good thing because people uh, are upgrading for the new camera. It's going to drive ASPs. It's going to drive new units. Um, so I, I think it's good news for Apple at this point. Anurag, can you line up where you take the most signals from when particularly when it comes to china we're all trying to read those tea leaves at the moment and yes we've got Tmall; they're selling out within a minute or so but then barclays are saying early pre-order data from china continues to point to difficult iphone 15 cycle negative mix shift where do you go for the signals that are the right read so, you know, one of the things you have to think about, I think about it from Apple's point of view, uh, they do want to ship these things if there are orders. So when we look at lead times and we track it every day, you know, sometimes it's very difficult to say whether it is because of the changing mix shift of the model uh, with some supply issues or is it just a demand. I think this is why we need several more weeks of data before we can, you know, comfortably say that Apple sales are going to be healthy over the next 12 months because uh, December quarter is the big quarter for, uh, you know, all consumer electronics and Apple's no, uh, you know, no different there. Yeah, Morgan Stanley overweight price target 215. They too are saying that actually the China data points are better than expected. So we try to dissect where to get the real takeaway. I, can you update us a little bit on your worries and risks around China? It felt like the narrative of last week after their event. What then of now? Are you getting any more signals on just the sturdiness of consumer and indeed government purchases? 
Yeah, I think Mark Gurman, you know, really, uh, you know, I talked to him about it, and it really one of the things you have to remember that last time something like this happened or increased rise of nationalism in China, it did have a negative impact on Apple. So we just want to make sure that because what the government said for, you know, the government phones, which is not a new news, it's been around for a while, uh, but it was splashed around quite a bit that it didn't change the consumer behavior. And so far, it looks like things are on track for Apple. But again, we need a lot more data to be comfortable for the next financial year. You know, I just reflecting on, on being at Cupertino last week, and there was a lot of emphasis on the color selection for the Pro, the higher end Pro and Pro Max. Because in China, red and gold resonate with the consumer. We didn't get that. But the Chinese consumer also tends to favor the latest technology, you know, powerful processing, next generation camera. In your analysis, Anurag, do you see a differentiation between consumer behaviors in North America, Europe, China? Oh, it's massive behavior. I mean, gold would do really well in India, Middle East. Uh, I mean, I can, I, I can, you know, think of a few more countries. You know, I personally, I'm going to get the blue one next on Friday, but uh, I know a lot of people who would want the red and the gold. If anyone wants to know, I would definitely be a gold kind of a gal, but I then go and buy a really ugly, clunky thing to cover it all up yeah, with so that I don't broke it. <laughs> okay. Anurag Rana, we thank you. Enjoy your blue version, Bloomberg Intelligence. And, I mean, Ed, the fact that you just said it's a week ago, well, yeah. just over, that you're in Cupertino. Time just flies, but this really was the purpose point that we were hearing from Apple, so, the new unveil, and as to whether or not, it seems as though the mixed signals are pointing that it is a positive sense. It's why going over the technology is so important. Yeah. You know, the story was the Chinese government saying to government agencies and state enterprises, tell your staff to leave their iPhone at home, get a Chinese brand. Would that impact the psychology of the Chinese consumer at large? Yeah. Well, that's what we just talked about. No, they like color preferences. They want the latest technology. Five years of data tell us that. They so want foldable phones. Yep. There's a great piece on the terminal about the lack of foldable coming from Apple. Yeah, it was funny because when we were in Google I.O. earlier in the year, they came out with Pixel Fold and they had really high compute. Yeah. And then we started talking about running AI, gener gen generative AI locally on devices. For me, it's just a feel in the hand thing, you know, clunkiness of, of folding the phone. But maybe that resonates in China, too. And we know that the price point resonates in China. It also resonates for the bottom line and the fact that this yeah. is going to be driving up average selling prices. So uh, um, certainly some price targets still on the higher side for Apple. Meanwhile, though, coming up, look, we're just talking about AI. Let's dig into it a little bit more, particularly when it comes to digital health. We're going to be joined by M13 partner Latif Parachar. That's next. We're going to talk also about the IPOZ. Yeah, we're going to talk about uh, IPOs. But there is one mover that's been listed a little while. I want to talk about Rocket Lab down around 8% now. It had opened as much as 10% lower, its biggest drop since May of 2022. This is about a, a failed mission, small satellite launch on the Electron rocket, and the payload did not make it to orbit. This is the third time that they've had trouble with the Electron. It's a, it's a rocket provider that is a high cadence launcher, nowhere near SpaceX, but one of the ones actually putting stuff into space. But this third failure really impacting the shares. We will bring you more on that story throughout the program. This is Bloomberg Technology. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Caroline Hyde in New York. And I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. No, you're not. You're here. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> How? How did I get here? <laughs> Let's move on quickly and cover that with markets. NASDAQ 100, tech leading losses in public markets. Remember, the Fed makes its decision in 24 hours' time, widely expected to hold rates. We follow rates because they discount the future values of present cash flows the other way around. But also, if you're a private market investor and you're looking at public proxies, you're paying attention as well. Bitcoin, as you've been discussing in the past week, Caroline, continues to kind of march a little bit higher despite the risk-off sentiment that we're seeing. But look at yields creep higher as well. I think all eyes on the Fed, despite what's happening in other areas of the public markets in the tech sector. Yeah, we've got to go micro. It's all eyes on one particular IPO today. We're awaiting where it trades. Instacart, our own Shanali Basakas. Of course, keeping abreast of where we're going to be going from a price point. It looks like it's going to pop. Shanali, it looks like we're going to rise higher. 
Oh, uh, yeah, sorry about that. I didn't hear you over there, Caroline. So, yes, we are waiting for it to open, and it is indicated to price around $42 a share. That makes it more than a 40% pop if it makes it at the open. It also gives it a valuation upon the open at about $14 billion. That is not only above where it expected to be valued at out of the gate, it also is above its most recent funding round when it was valued and it slashed its own internal valuation to closer to $13 billion. And so upon the IPO pop, you are getting a little bit of boosted valuation. It's still, as we've been talking about, a far cry from that $39 billion valuation that it was able to ink in the heydays of the pandemic for Instacart when a lot of people were using the delivery app. Now, I know you and I will talk about this later, but the sell that Instacart might have as an AI-focused company, yeah. it doesn't even meet what you would get from Clavio as well that is pitching the same type of idea here and is expected to price tonight in Instacart's uh, wake. You had also Clavio up there, IPO pricing range as well. Let's Let's see if they're able to meet that, especially because the markets they're meeting are a little more muted than the markets we saw last week that Arm had listed into. Yeah, it's interesting that Arm is coming off of those previous highs, but Arm's big sell was it's an artificial intelligence empowering company. And I actually spoke to Fiji Simo about really the AI pitch that she's trying to take to the investor at the moment. And they, she's saying, look, with generative AI in particular, there's a really big opportunity to make the grocery even more convenient. We have all the data, they've got the expertise, they're making that experience happen. But look, it does take time, Shanali. But that's sort of their moat, isn't it? The fact that they've got this proprietary data that others aren't going to be able to have that's going to be a tough sell though to remind people to go with them over the competition particularly not only for an investor that's institutional but a retail investor that they're pitching to right now it's a great question and you talk about the retail investor remember this is the first IPO underwritten by SoFi which is one of the secondary underwriters in this particular IPO we've seen SoFi for example serve as an allocator to almost a dozen IPOs besides this one but to the point you're making this is the idea of bringing more retail interest in as far as the moat goes you're right they are pitching their own data as it pertains to their uh, their client base here but there is a general concern about what the margins for this business looks like like and how fast they can keep diversifying, bringing in kind of that ad money as well. And what the broader economic environment looks like throughout the programming today, we've been talking about how much the consumer can come under pressure with some of these inflationary forces still at the fore. I would say Instacart, Clavio hitting the market right before that big Fed decision timing is everything in the IPO market. And remember, we do have a scenario here in which even with the market flat to lower for the S&P 500, NASDAQ, and the SOC Semiconductor Index, you still have these IPO pops. It just tells you how much is at stake here uh, for investors who want a, a play at new shares, as well as, remember, the question I've been yeah. getting all day, who wins? Think about Sequoia, D1, which will still have a very significant stake in this post-IPO, as well as some of the founders themselves of, of these large investment firms. Dan Sundheim personally will have a stake in Instacart out of the listing. Well said. I mean, we're looking at the ticking higher in terms of the indication price now at $42.61, Shanali. The fact that they have, like Arm, Taking that playbook of having a lot of intentional investors who are going to be sticking around, taking a huge amount, I think about two thirds of the overall shares that are going on offer, are already been allocated to some of these linchpin investors, the PepsiCo's of this world. What did you make of that sort of new tactic that we have going on? Yeah, it's interesting. Limiting the flow, drumming up interest, uh, PepsiCo being involved from the beginning. Clavio has a different set of cornerstone investors, more along the lines of the investment community, the lines of an alliance Bernstein involved early on. But this seems to be the Goldman Sachs playbook, doesn't it? Uh, they are leading this round of IPOs. They were one of the lead underwriters on ARM. They are lead on the Instacart. They are lead on Clavio. It is a big moment for Goldman Sachs in this wave of tech listings. Instacart CFO as well, we know, had that Goldman uh, Sachs alma mater, uh, that expertise over there in terms of what it means to take a company public, especially in the world of TMT technology, media, and telecom. Mm. Uh, that's also by the way, the relationship that brought in SoFi with Anthony Noto, formerly in that world at Goldman Sachs as well. The new kids in town are David Ludwig, who leads global equity capital markets over at Goldman Sachs. Uh, Kim Posnett, who recently took over as head of TMT at Goldman Sachs. Big moments for them. Arm was a success. 
Instacart is looking like it's about to be more than 40% of a pop on day one, even yeah. in a down market. And Clavio tonight, trifecta. <laughs> I mean, yeah, all eyes on Nick Giovanni. He's going to be waiting with bated breath, of course, the CFO of Instacart, who is overheading DMT globally for Goldman up until 2021. Shanali, always so great to get your perspective when it comes to the ins and outs of what's happening on Wall Street and the people behind these sorts of deals. And we also know that people that have been backing these sorts of deals are, of course, the venture capital community. And let's therefore dig into VC Spotlight. We're taking a look at, well, overall, the IPO pipeline, the excitement that breeds for certain players, such as M13. And we've got the general partner joining us about some of the areas they've been allocating to of late. Latif Paracha, he leads the firm's investing strategy, focusing on digital health in particular, on fintech. You've got, what, $900 million in assets under management. And just for a moment, the IPO, the excitement, the exuberance of some companies that are VC-backed becoming public. What does that mean when you're writing a Series A check? Thanks, Caroline. Thanks, Ad, for having me on. It's incredibly exciting. I mean, to unlock the IPO markets really then unlocks the growth market, which as an early stage investor, ultimately, that's what we're looking for. And there's Instacart, Clavio's tonight. And then we think there's a significant pipeline of really great companies that will unlock after that. So we're, it's very exciting and uh, you know, the best companies go public. And so we are always as VCs investing in early stage looking for those you know, generational companies to go IPO. Is it really that much of a domino effect? So you see several companies go public. If you are a startup's done series A, B, C, D, E through M, does that open up the opportunity then for you to do a big growth stage round because there's more money going into public markets as well? It all trickles from the public markets. And so the growth investors that fund our companies need to return capital to their investors. We all have to return capital to our investors. And the way that uh, the momentum will work is with the IPOs that will start to unlock. They'll start to return capital. And then they can invest that new fresh funds into our companies, which is going to be required ultimately to get them to the scale that a Clavio or an Instacart is today. I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated by valuations at, at all end of the curve for startups. You know, those names that have gone public in this past week really emphasized artificial intelligence as if it was going to help them out. Is the same thing happening at the other end in early stage where you attach AI to your domain name, uh, you, you, your valuation goes up? That happens. Um, we're very sensitive to that as a firm. You know, we really believe in hype cycles and being very sensitive to where we are in hype cycles. But hype cycles can be a good thing. Uh, in AI, you know, it allows for boardroom conversations and budgets to open up, and that can really help our, our companies. But we're very sensitive to the valuations that um, early stage companies can attach and making sure that the founders that are building these companies really have domain expertise in AI and have a clear path to, to show how the AI is going to enable some product or service that can, that can service the end customer. And everyone's been trying to push that forward. Like, where is the disruption coming? Which industry groups? Legal, clear. But healthcare has been time and time again referenced. Is that something that you're focusing in on? Yeah, it's a big focus for our firm and for me personally. If you look at healthcare in this country, it's $4 trillion of spend, nearly 20% of GDP. And I think we're really still in the very early days of the digital transformation. So we've, at the firm, invested in really innovative care delivery models uh, around new areas of medicine, like Form, which is a market leader, and obesity. And we've spent a lot of time now focusing in on how can you use AI to really support clinicians and health systems to drive better uh, care and ultimately better outcomes for patients. And that's really always our end goal, is how can you deliver better outcomes and simultaneously rip costs out of the system. I mean, we had a VC on from Underscore VC yesterday based in Boston. We're thinking of Fujisimo and her team at Instacart celebrating in San Francisco today. Does it matter where these founders, where these businesses are being cultivated, being born? How are you getting access to all of them? Founders can be built you know, anywhere. We're, we'll go anywhere to find the best founders. Ultimately, what we're focused on is founders that have real domain expertise. And so I'd love to give you an example of a company we just announced called Carnostics which is providing uh, localized AI for health systems. And so it ingests the healthcare data of any healthcare system. Yes. And by doing so, it's able to detect diseases much earlier. So of the four trillion of spend in the US, 90% of it is because chronic diseases go undiagnosed. And so they've shown and have great data to show that chronic kidney disease, for example, they can identify three times the number of patients. They can identify uh, 20 times the number of asthma patients much earlier on. And this can really drive uh, tremendous 
you know, uh, health spans and life spans for patients. And that to us is really, really critical. So we'll go anywhere, but ultimately in the case of this company, uh, the, the, the CEO is based in Philadelphia, so I took the, the, the short train ride over and sat down and, and, and you know, we, we, we did a deal. And, and that company, the founder, we think is a leading AI expert in the world. All right, and 13 general partner, uh, Latif Paracha, thank you so much. Coming up here on Bloomberg Technology, how one company is helping other businesses better adapt to the work from home model. My goodness, we have a debate coming up. We'll talk to Yuk van der Voort, the CEO of Remote. That's next, this is Bloomberg Technology. breaking news crossing the Bloomberg terminal. Clavio is said to plan to sell IPO shares for $29 or more. I believe the range had been 27 to 29, boosted up from 25 to 27, 24 hours ago, a lot of 20s. But what Bloomberg's reporting is Clavio is said to plan to sell its IPO shares for $29 or more. That is the one that we're waiting for Wednesday. A lot more going on before then, but we'll keep tracking the latest on that listing. Now, back to Bloomberg Technology. As the worst of the pandemic subsides, the debates over working from home have gained more traction, with many workers wanting to stay home for various reasons, while many CEOs want them back in the office. In the past week, the number of US workers that have returned to the office jumped 50% from pre-pandemic levels. That's where human resources platforms like Remote come in interesting name. Today it's launching its global HR platform to assist companies with hiring and management and joining us from San Francisco is its CEO, Joop van der Voort. Thank you for joining us here on Bloomberg Technology. I, I want to start with the debate. You're kind of pinning the company on this future where hybrid work at least or remote work continues. Why do you have such faith in that model? Well, first of all, thank you for having me. It's not so much that we think about uh, whether people are working from home or working remotely. It's more that what we see is that modern businesses, they hire people from everywhere. It's very hard to find great people in the direct vicinity of your office. And what we see is that more and more businesses start to look for talent internationally. And so that's really where we focus at. And that's what we help facilitate companies to find people, hire people, truly anywhere. So this platform you've announced, it's intended to help companies with staff in multiple jurisdictions, not just companies, but all over the world. Why is that needed? Why was there a gap in the market for that? So up until now, we would help companies hire people abroad. And this was usually a small number of people as what is called an employer of record. And as we've grown, what we realized is that many of these companies ended up having multiple HQs, offices in different countries, and what they had to do to be able to support all of those is hire or a bunch of people locally and buy a whole bunch of software and then try to hook it up together. Now, we've built this international infrastructure to actually make sure that you can stay compliant, and we've made it into a single platform. So rather than having five tools for five different countries, now you can do all of it with us directly. It feels like a competitive space. I was just speaking with the deal founder, your remote. What are the various offerings at the moment, particularly coming from some really well-backed, VC-backed startups right now? I mean, for us, we focus on compliance first, and that is how we build our platform. Um, and that means that we run payroll for you, regardless of how somebody's employed, whether it's through us, through your own entity, we can help you out, pay out contractors, but above all, we help you maintain compliance across the world in your team. So that means that we can help you onboard people, also offboard people, help them with compensation, and really everything that comes with hiring somebody in any place on the planet. Let's talk about any place on the planet, because we know mm -hmm. that there has been, prior to perhaps the current slowdown, ferocious talent wars. Now then people start to let people go. And what became abundantly clear was it's harder to let go of certain employees in certain regions. I'm thinking of our home area of Europe at the moment. How is that factoring into how people are starting to rehire, particularly when it comes to the area of AI? There is expertise in France, but it's also quite hard to let go of workers there. How does that factor into some of your clients' perspective? That's absolutely true. I think one of the things that we try to do is help inform our customers what is the trade-off. You want to hire somebody great in France? Well, this is what you have to think about. The way I think about it is that if you are committed to hire somebody, you take into account that it might cost a bit more if you end up having to let that person go. 
but at the same time, that individual gets significantly more protections and is much less likely to leave you as an employer. And so there's a there's an ups and a downs uh, to either situation, but uh, above all, we believe that companies ultimately uh, want to hire great people, and we will facilitate that no matter where they are. Yeah, we started the segment talking about the data we have for return to office. What does the data you have tell you about the movement of people back to office spaces? Well, uh, in our case, the one thing that we really look at is whether companies are hiring more internationally. So we don't really know if people are working from an office or are they working from home or anywhere else. But what we do see is that people hire, uh, companies hire more and more internationally. And that trend continues to grow. And especially as certain roles are in very high demand, like, for example, AI researchers, well, you're going to hire them no matter where they are. And that trend continues to expand and that market continues to grow very much. Yep, great to have some time with you. Thank you, Jörg van der Voort, his CEO of Remote. Thank Meanwhile, you. coming up, so many more executive discussions to have. So we actually have some breaking news as well because Instacart has started trading at $42 a share. Remember, they priced their shares at $30 a share. So now we have a pop in excess of some 40%. So $42 a share in your opening trade when it comes to the parent company that is Maple Bear, of course, is what they chose with the name to still stick with, but is, of course, Instacart. And we do see overall that this is a company that's managing to have a significant rise on the opening trade. It's taken a fair few hours, and of course it always does, but 40% on the nose. We're currently up 39%, as you see, in the first trade. I'm very pleased to say we've got one Abigail Doolittle who's been standing by waiting for this moment and boy it's even bigger tick higher than we had for arm in previous week yeah it's very impressive caroline indeed we have the shares of instacart trading higher by 39 percent right now so we're looking at a valuation uh, that is closer to 14 billion it had been priced of course at 30 dollars a share which would have been a roughly 10 billion dollar valuation so a very strong opening of 42 percent at this point and they of course raised 660 million dollars uh, and they uh, sold 22 million shares 14.1 million going to the company and then 7.9 million going to other investors such as Tiger and Co. Too. So you can imagine that some of these investors are really pretty happy. Now it is interesting though of course the 2021 valuation $39 billion but the Instacart or excuse me the IPO window that was open last week uh, by ARM seems to be successful right now uh, for Instacart and then tonight of course for uh, Clavio and then there's other filings out there such as Birkenstock. One big question will of course be technology next year. This is really important important, especially since rates are still high, it puts pressure on some of these high growth uh, issues. Now, one thing I would note that you and Ed have noted all hour is the fact that ARM opened very strong, up 25 percent, but in the three days that have followed, down about 5 percent each day. Uh, it'll be interesting to see whether or not this one can hold on to its gains. It's also interesting, Caroline, to note the fact that back during the pandemic, during the big IPO, I don't know if Bubble is correct, but you had Bumble, you had uh, Airbnb and some of the those other names uh, popping 80, 90 percent on the day. So not quite there, but nonetheless, given the fact that this is uh, the second big IPO of this year, up 39 percent, not so shabby at all. Mm -hmm. 11 billion. There we have it currently at a market capitalization. Abigail Doolittle, thank you. Let's go out to Shanali Bassett because, boy, Nick Giovanni, CFO, is going to be pleased with the way in which that seems to be steered for the opening trade. But what do they need to do to ensure this demand was there? They really curtailed supply. They had locked in cornerstone investors. Yeah, locking in those investors was a key to the success of this IPO, as we know, for ARM as well. And as we know, Clavio coming tonight has done a similar thing in terms of locking in those big names early on. Now, when we look at the trading today, still it was able to achieve that 40% pop, even as it increased its pricing range in the days leading up to the IPO, as well as selling at the top end of that range. As we were talking here in the last 30 minutes, we found that Clavio as well may seek to price at the high end of the range or even higher. And so you were seeing excitement coming into these stocks early on. We know that these big cornerstone investors played a key role in the IPOs, but we also know that retail investors are also playing a very key role in these first day pops. You look at the Nasdaq trading last week and you look at the likes of Fidelity and just how many orders came in the day of when it came from the retail flow. And you think about the role of SoFi as well, also led by former Goldman banker uh, Anthony Noto. And they are the underwriter for the first time, putting capital 
capital at play for an IPO in the Instacart listing. Now, again, they are front rating some critical economic events. The Fed decision tomorrow. Clavio also looking ahead to get any get ahead of any potential volatility in the market. But what an interesting day to list. Even with the S&P down, the Nasdaq down, the Nasdaq 100 and composite, the SOX Semiconductor Index down. You are getting a 40 percent pop at the opening trade for Instacart, as well as more excitement around future IPOs. Uh, to the point you're making, more in the pipeline. Birkenstock's also looking to go public. A lot of these companies with the AI play looking to also go public. Our source is telling us people trying to really front load those IPOs into the first quarter of next year, uh, trying to really capitalize on all of this investor interest that is coming into new stock. And ahead of any political well, disruptions that might come as we look towards an election as well. Shanali Basak, fantastic to get the ins and outs. I want to give context because context is everything. And Jackie Davlos has that for us because you've been following Instacart for years. And it's interesting. I look back to a press release that was in 2020 when the company raised 600 million backed by D1 Capital Partners at a valuation to 7.6 billion. Today, they raised 660 million with a valuation of about 11 billion and they go public. It's been a long old road, Jackie. It's been over 10 years in the making. As a startup, Instacart raised nearly $3 billion from huge investors, Fidelity, D1, Tiger. Uh, and since then, they've really matured as a business. But let's kind of take a step back before Fiji Simo took the helm a few years ago. The business was run by Apoorva Mehta, who had really placed the consumer-facing app at the forefront of the business. And it got a major tailwind with the pandemic, people ordering online, but that couldn't stick around forever. You had competition rolling in from Uber and DoorDash, um, other bigger players, Walmart starting its own delivery business, Amazon trying to kind of get into the play. And so you had the business really getting pressure by investors in the market broadly to really diversify its revenue streams. And when Fiji Simo came in, as you remember, she was a former Meta Facebook uh, executive who really build that monetization strategy, incorporate advertising, and it was no different when she came into Instacart, really built out that revenue stream. And from one of the things that we learned from the S1, that advertising revenue now accounts for 30 percent of its overall revenue. Um, and it's going to be incredibly important. So this IPO is not just about showing, look, we're giving some liquidity back to our employees, but this is the business that's now matured and what they have to offer going forward. Jackie Davalos, well said. Context changes everything. Meanwhile, of course, I am noting that well, the context is this is a female bringing an IPO. Less than 1% of IPOs are brought by women. Now, I know Fiji Simo wants to be thought of as a leader. It doesn't matter that whether she's female, male, whatever. But of course, well, for some, it's worth noting. From New York, I'm very pleased to say that that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Ed? Yeah, don't forget, recap the show on our podcast. You can find it wherever you get yours, Terminal, Spotify, iHeart and Apple. This is Bloomberg Technology.